Ukraine's president wraps up a tour of Europe as this part of the conflict in his country inches close to the one-year mark. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed leaders at a European Council summit in Brussels on Thursday. In his speech, he emphasized Ukrainians' desire to join the EU. Long-lasting peace in Europe will be established only when Ukraine wins and becomes a member of the EU and NATO. This is the kind of unity we managed to build today. The unity is that the European Union will be with us, with Ukraine, until the victory of Ukraine, and Ukraine will be in the European Union. Zelensky also pushed for more artillery and fighter jets during his visits to Britain and France. Alex Cardia has this report from Brussels. Well, President Zelensky came to Brussels primarily to thank his European allies. Billions of euros have been spent uh, from the 27 member states and from the European Union on supporting Ukraine in the face of Russia's invasion. That is one thing that was clear from the president's presentation in Brussels. He also wanted to ask for more help, maybe for more fighter jets or for fighter jets. Now, there seems to be possibly an agreement behind the scenes that may have happened. But President Zelensky saying nothing is ready to be made public yet. So we wait to hear more on that front. Now, uh, on the other hand, accession to the European Union, a big theme for President Zelensky. He said, look, we want to be members of the EU. We want those accession negotiations to begin uh, within a year. That is a different timeline to what the Europeans are saying. Ursula von der Leyen, the EU Commission president last week, saying, look, it'll happen when it happened. It's a merits-based system. There is no rigid timeline. But what is clear is that the Ukrainians want that access as quickly as possible and the Europeans are saying it can happen. It's just a question of whether or not you put those reforms in place. So really a hero's welcome. Uh, President Zelensky talking about European values, saying that Ukraine is depending European values in the face of Russia's invasion and that really uh, the future of Europe is in the hands of the Ukrainian armed forces. So a very powerful uh, visit to Brussels by the Ukrainian president today. Alex Kadia, CGTN, Brussels. To discuss this and more, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Brussels, Peter Klepe is the editor-in-chief of the Brussels Report. From London, Marcus Papadopoulos is a historian, analyst and author specializing in Russia and the former Soviet Union. Here in Washington, D.C., Anton Fedyashin is professor of history at American University. And from New York, we are joined by Andriy Dobryansky, who is the chair of UN Affairs at the Ukrainian World Congress. Welcome to all of you. Andriy Dobryansky, uh, so the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, he's been on quite a busy diplomatic, very extensive diplomatic uh, trip to Europe. He was in London. He addressed the British Parliament there. He held meetings with the British Prime Minister. He's also been in Paris, where he held a very high-level talks with the French President Emmanuel Macron as well as the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and of course as we just saw he had meetings in Brussels as well with European leaders. Um, what in your view did this trip achieve? More so than one can have over a Zoom call as we are this evening. So uh, what is necessary for diplomacy is always that face-to-face -face contact. We've had had some European leaders uh, come to Ukraine. We've had uh, ministers from the United States and other places come to Ukraine to have conversations with Zelensky. But beyond having calls or virtual sessions, it's always good to get together uh, in person uh, for them to understand, for them to realize as much as possible what the situation is on the ground directly from the president. And that is the basis for international diplomacy. Well, I get your point about face-to-face -face meetings, but what did he actually get? He got exactly what we've been working on for this entire year, which is step by step inching closer to those promises of weapons systems yet to come, not only the weapon systems that are already set to arrive earlier uh, in, in less than a month's time in Ukraine. That includes from the United States, the Bradley fighting vehicles, and also personally thanking the European leaders for their promise of the Leopard tanks, some of which have already begun slowly arriving, but more and more in the next in the near term. So that when we start talking about, as they surely did today, the promise of uh, fighter jets in the future, Poland and other countries have already said they're willing to do this. 
that we know that there is a segmented uh, strategy. So first we have the Bradley fighting vehicles, then the M1 Abrams along with the Leopards, and then eventually closing the skies with those F-16s. Peter Klebe, President Zelensky has been promised tanks. He uh, has been promised tanks from Germany as well as the uh, United States. Uh, he also wants fighter jets, but not everyone in Europe is comfortable with that last request. In fact, the Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, talked to the BBC and he said, and I'm quoting him here, he said, the pros and cons, you have to make absolutely sure you're not getting into an Article 5 direct confrontation between NATO and Russia. Article 5, of course, is that part of the uh, NATO charter, which uh, is the collective defense doctrine where an attack on one is considered an attack on all. How big is the fear in Europe that this conflict, uh, as it continues, could escalate very quickly into a much wider conflict which would involve Russia, Ukraine, and all 30 members of NATO? Uh, well, the fear is, is, um, is quite serious, uh, it's quite, uh, quite big. Um, that's why, uh, you know, the debate on uh, whether to send tanks to Ukraine was so uh, so tense. Uh, Germany in particular was very skeptical about this. Um, it, it even um, uh, made it very difficult to reach a decision on allowing, um, you know, tanks um, from other nations to be uh, exported uh, to Ukraine. Uh, Germany was able to do that because uh, we were talking about uh, German Thanks. Uh, now, in the end, uh, Germany uh, gave in, uh, but uh, it made it very clear that one of the red lines uh, threw out all of this, um, apart from uh, the fact that, of course, uh, European countries are very happy to help Ukraine defend itself, uh, is that it's absolutely a priority to avoid uh, a direct confrontation between NATO and, um, and Russia. What about fighter jets, Peter? Because, you know, I mean, I just read you that quote from Mark Ritter, the uh, Dutch Prime Minister, but uh, no sooner had Britain, uh, during the visit by Zelensky, been talking about training Ukrainian pilots that we heard reports late on Thursday out of London saying, well, look, not so fast. We're not going to do anything that's going to endanger the national security of Britain. What does that mean? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, it looks like for now it's a largely a symbolic move because uh, the pilots will be, will be trained. Uh, but, uh, I mean, this is not like um, a commitment to actually send uh, fighter jets. Interestingly, France has been relatively open to this. Um, I mean, French President Macron has not ruled it out to send fighter jets. Uh, you may remember that, um, I think it was in March or April 2022, uh, there was a discussion on whether to send uh, fighter jets to Ukraine. I mean, then... Uh, the EU high representative, Mr. Borrell, sort of announced that uh, European countries would be sending fighter jets, but then ultimately it was sort of vetoed by, uh, by the Pentagon. Um, so this debate has been going on for a while. There are experts who say, look, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the question is also how useful this would be, um, you know, for, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, because Russia is sort of not entirely or, or, or not engaging um, too much in, in the air. Um, so I think, um, yeah, th th these are sort of the discussions, uh, but ultimately, like in whatever context, uh, certainly um, mainland Europe, um, less so the Anglo-Saxon powers, are very wary of uh, this conflict escalating, as you say, and uh, NATO ending up in a direct clash with, uh, with Russia. Marcos Papadopoulos, uh, earlier this week, Russia's uh, defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, he condemned the West for supplying weapons to Ukraine. Let's listen to some of what he had to say. The U.S. and its allies are trying to prolong the conflict as much as possible. To do this, they have started supplying heavy offensive weapons, openly urging Ukraine to seize our territories. In fact, these steps are dragging NATO countries into the conflict and could lead to an unpredictable level of escalation. So, Marcus, there you hear the Russian defense minister saying that he believes these weapons supplies have already dragged NATO into the conflict. Does he have a valid point? I must say, first of all, that Zelensky's visit to London, Paris and Brussels was simply an exercise in crude propaganda which has no bearing on the war in Ukraine. 
but allow me to tell you what does have a bearing. As I speak now, unfolding in Bakhmut or Artemovsk is a strategic disaster for the Ukrainian armed forces because tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers and their equipment have been devoured there, which will enable the Russian army not only to advance to the western part of the Donetsk Oblast, but also to enable the Russians to advance to the oblasts of, of Dnipropetrovsk and Kharkov. And in regard to Shoigu's comments this week, well, we know very well that this is not a war between Russia and Ukraine. Indeed, it is a war between NATO and Russia. The former Ukrainian defense minister said so only recently that Ukraine is fighting NATO's war against Russia. Now, are, is there a distinct possibility for there to be a war between NATO and Russia? Yeah. No, I do not believe that. Okay. Why? Because the Americans and the Russians, ever since the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, speak with each other every single day of yeah. the week, of the month, of the year. That is why there is very little chance of a war breaking out between them. All right, Marcus, them. I want to ask you something that you uh, just get some clarification on what you said right at the beginning. You said this visit by Zelensky to Europe is crude propaganda. Uh, how do you square that? This is the leader of a country that's in a conflict right now, and he is seeking help. Well, first of all, uh, Zelensky's uh, stance on the war and the British and uh, European uh, elite's stance on the war is not agreed with by ordinary people in both Britain and Europe. People in Britain and in Europe want to see an end to the war in Ukraine. They do not wish to see more and more arms being sent to the Ukrainian government. At the same time, they do not wish to see the Russian government send more and more arms to Ukraine. Ordinary people in Europe wish this war to come to an end, and they wish for this war to be brought to an end through diplomatic means. Right. Now, some people might cite um, opinion poll findings of institutes in Europe yeah. which show that European people support the sending of equipment to Ukraine. Well, quite frankly, those institutes are neither free nor independent. Okay. They are controlled by the Western uh, elites. Right. OK. Anton Fedyoshin, um, let me get your view on this. What do you read into this diplomatic offensive by President Zelensky going to London, to Brussels and to Paris? Well, it tells us several things. First of all, that um, uh, Vladimir Zelensky is becoming uh, very alarmed by the fact that uh, Ukraine is being displaced from the, the center of people's uh, attention, <clears throat> both in uh, uh, the continent of Europe and uh, Great Britain, uh, also in the United States. Um, look, we saw a little bit of this uh, with Joe Biden's um, State of the Union address where he spoke for almost 75 minutes, and uh, Ukraine only got one of them uh, out of it. So um, uh, Zelensky is doing the absolute right thing in sort of making himself and the, his country, the conflict, uh, relevant. Uh, but the, the fact that he's doing that already tells us that um, uh, Ukraine fatigue is uh, setting in. Number two, the other thing uh, that it tells us is that uh, uh, clearly the conflict in Ukraine is not one of existential importance to NATO, to Europe, to the United States, or to the West. Uh, we certainly hear that uh, very often, but if this really were a conflict with existential implications and importance, NATO would be fighting uh, in Ukraine. It's as simple as that, with all of the risks uh, and the potential catastrophe that that would uh, uh, entail. That's what you do when something is of existential uh, importance. Uh, this is the narrative that um, Vladimir Zelensky has been, has been uh, voicing. Uh, in Europe, it will fall onto some ears that will be uh, receptive. Um, but again, I'm afraid that, uh, that the, this is being moved to the peripheral 
uh, edge of uh, European affairs. And short of the Russians doing something stupid and uh, uh, catastrophic, um, this is still a war of attrition. And unfortunately for the Ukrainians, the Russians simply have much more uh, of a resource uh, to work through. Andre, what is your response to what we've just heard there? Is there alarm among Ukrainians, among the Ukrainian leadership, that uh, there could be something like Ukraine fatigue creeping right now? Uh, that is a phrase that has tried to be worked into the public discourse and just hasn't caught on, unfortunately, for our enemy. Uh, when, we, when we hear uh, people talking about that, all I know is that I talk to legislators, local administrators around the United States, of which we have resolutions and proclamations on a regular basis. The same thing happens all over the United Kingdom. Uh, I've never seen in my lifetime, obviously, Ireland being involved in an international conflict, and yet it has come out very forcefully, both at the United States Security Council as also the first ever visit by the Taisha to Ukraine this past summer. This conflict has shown that the rest of the world absolutely stands with Ukraine. And it is not just that one minute in President Biden's State of the Union address, but it is the additional drawdown that was announced two days prior to that uh, statement. It was the phone call between Dmitry Kuleba and, and Secretary of State Anthony Blinken the morning of the State of the Union address. And it is what we're going to hear at the Munich Security Conference next week as well. These are constant reinforcements of the fact that the rest of the world is supporting Ukraine. And it is, in fact, the enemy of Ukraine that does not have international support, that does not have any other resources to, to lean on other than states to sponsors of terrors right. or, their over, or their overburdened uh, prison system, which is where they're getting the most of their recu recruits. Okay, Andre, the other thing I wanted you to respond to is what Marcus Papadopoulos told us about uh, the status of the battle uh, in the eastern part of the country. Uh, he uh, mentioned a trope that has been going on for several months now, that Bakhmut is about to fall. Don't worry, the Russian victory is at hand. We have these 40,000 Russian prisoners who have been enabled to rape and pillage their way across the countryside. I mean, we've been hearing this for a while. But in fact, what is very obvious is that Russia's forces are not able to conquer any more of Ukraine. And we will see that in the coming months. Marcus, what is your response to that? I would like to say two things. Firstly, the West claims that the world is united against Russia. Well, let's put that to the test. Out of 193 countries in the world, only 30 or so have placed sanctions on Russia. Furthermore, out of 193 countries in the world, again, only 30 or so have sent military equipment to the Ukrainian government. Thus, the world is not united against Russia. The world does not agree with the stance of the West on Russia. Secondly, the reality on the battlefield in Ukraine is that the Ukrainian armed forces have sustained colossal fatalities. We are hearing estimates, including from Israel's foreign intelligence service, the Mossad, that over 150,000 Ukrainian soldiers have died and possibly 200,000 have been wounded. On top of that, the Russians are poised to launch an almighty offensive, possibly offensives, right. which will mark the beginning of the end of the war in Ukraine. So any talk that Russia is losing this war yeah. is simply preposterous nonsense. Okay. Anton Fedyoshin, I want to get to one other development, which has been getting a lot of attention on social media, but not making the headlines in the mainstream media. And that is a report, an article written by the renowned American journalist Seymour Hersh. He published a lengthy, exhaustive investigative piece on the Nord Stream pipeline. It goes into great detail about how the pipeline was blown up, including who did it and how it was done. He points the figure, finger firmly at the United States. In fact, if we look at some of the background to this, both President Biden and his point person on Ukraine, Victoria Newland, have talked about destroying the pipeline. Uh, looking at this report and what's come out now, does this change the calculus of what's going on in Europe as far as the conflict is concerned? No, I don't think it does, actually, Anna. And I think the Europeans have suspected for a while that it wasn't the Russians who blew up their own uh, pipeline for absolutely no purpose. 
Um, but uh, look, uh, Europe is becoming so dependent on the United States uh, that I don't think it's going to have uh, m much of a difference uh, at all. I think the the bigger question uh, really here is the are going to be the is going to be the economic impact on Europe because the Soviet Union and Russia were um, was same country in different times uh, a reliable uh, supplier of cheap gas. Uh, for Europe. Um, that cheap gas contributed to remarkable levels of European uh, economic uh, growth uh, over the past 50-odd uh, years. Um, that foundation for economic uh, prosperity in Europe has been uh, knocked out. Um, now the Europeans will have to buy their energy resources at much higher prices, which will have a systemic impact on European economies, which we're already seeing. Look, the IMF just published uh, its uh, um, report uh, predicting the levels of growth of different uh, economies for this year. The, the Russian economy, by some miracle, is slated to grow by 0.3 percent, which, again, is nothing uh, terribly impressive unless, until, rather, you consider the amount of sanctions it's under. But there are two economies uh, of, of developed European nations that are scheduled to do worse than the Russian one. One of them is British, and the other one is German, and this is the IMF. Uh, prediction. So um, whoever's behind the, the pipeline and uh, Hirsch's article, which I uh, read, it, uh, gives granular detail, I think we'll find out eventually from memoirs and leaks over the next few years. Um, what we can say for sure is that the economic uh, impact on Europe has so far been very heavy, and it will only uh, get worse. The Europeans have time to fill their gas uh, storage facilities with uh, Russian gas uh, running coming up to this winter, uh, that will no longer be the case going into next winter a year from now. So we'll see what happens, but uh, uh, everyone's going to suffer. And if the Europeans thought that uh, slapping sanctions on Russia will have no blow blowback for European economies, I'm afraid that the, the reality is, uh, is going to correct that notion. Peter Kleppe, uh, surely there must be a recognition in European capitals uh, on the impact of this pipeline explosion, what it's going to do to the price of energy in Europe, what it's going to do to European industries, and ultimately what it's going to do to economic growth in Europe. But nobody is saying anything. No leader has stood up and said something about this. Well, to be fair, we're talking about the Nord Stream pipelines, and um, uh, no gas was coming through them. It's more sort of an impact uh, that could be felt in a scenario whereby Russian gas would once again flow through pipelines to Europe. Uh, there's still Russian gas arriving in Europe, but this is uh, LNG gas. Um, thanks to the weather and thanks to uh, China's uh, zero COVID policies, uh, Europe has uh, made it relatively well through the winter. Uh, but uh, the next winter may still uh, be tricky. And of course, on the longer term, there's a problem, as uh, your previous uh, speaker uh, mentioned, uh, for stable energy supply uh, to European economies. This yeah. is, of course, uh, of crucial uh, importance. Uh, however, um, Europe has massive uh, potential for its own fossil fuel production. I mean, let's not forget that the Netherlands has in Groningen one of the one of the biggest gas fields in the world, mm -hmm. and it refuses um, to, um, uh, to properly exploit it because of uh, earthquake uh, risks that, I mean, a very difficult yeah. debate, but I think uh, uh, the risks are overblown there. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, I said there was no uh, big response from European Union leaders on uh, this uh, blow up of the uh, pipeline, uh, but there wasn't much of a response from, from Russia either, was there? The Russians made their case very clearly and very emphatically and very persuasively last year after the Nord Stream pipelines were sabotaged. Indeed, the Russians wanted the United Nations Security Council to investigate the act of sabotage, but alas, the Americans and the British blocked that, which in my estimation was extremely telling and extremely suspicious. And quite frankly, anyone who still supports the notion that Russia sabotaged its own pipelines is quite simply gullible and imbecilic.
There was no reason why Russia would do that. Furthermore, Joe Biden at the start of 2022 said that if the Russian army enters Ukraine, then the Nord Stream pipelines will yeah. be destroyed. Therefore, it is quite simply the case that it was America and her allies that committed this heinous act of sabotage, which not only affected Russia, but also affected Germany. Yeah. Again, that demonstrates how America, how America treats its own allies. All right, uh, Andre, uh, we've just got a bit of time left, and I want to get to one other political development in Ukraine, and that is we're hearing that President Zelensky's political party is moving to replace the defense minister, Alexei Reznikov, with the country's intelligence chief. And, you know, we talked about this in other shows, that there's been quite a sweep out uh, in Ukraine by the president, getting rid of people uh, who've been involved in corruption, especially people who are linked to the military. But in this case, Reznikov has not been accused of anything, nor is he implicated in any kind of wrongdoing. Um, so what's going on? Well, just to clarify, uh, one member of uh, President Zelensky's party seemed to have uh, jumped the gun and said something that possibly would not have happened uh, because the defense minister has not been replaced. Uh, and uh, as opposed to having a sweep out of uh, the ministries, uh, there has simply been uh, individual cases up to maybe four or five people in the last month um, who, in quick response to several magazine articles saying that the price of eggs for the military is much too high, uh, they've been uh, removed from their position under questioning very, very quickly. And it's, a, it's the uh, demonstration of Ukraine as a highly responsive uh, government that is willing to root out corruption within its own ranks, uh, no matter what the cost. So as opposed to an entire sweep out of the ministry, which has not happened. OK, and we are going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C., and thank you for watching another edition of The Heat.